The urbanization of China has been absolutely stunning. I mean, you have about 100 cities that have passed the million mark in the last sort of 20 years. China has consumed about 50% of the world's cement supplies over the last five, six years. When you're there, I mean, it's an urban, I mean, the urbanization is just astonishing. You can go for 15 miles and you see vast areas of land that have just been graded, ready for the next wave of urbanization to take place. And it's an environmental disaster and a social disaster and all the rest of it, but obviously it's an economic boom. And property values are zooming up and people are becoming billionaires in property development in China. And in fact, one of the richest people in the world is a woman of 25 years old who, whose father set up a construction company in the early 1990s in, uh, in, in, in Guangdong province and they built these sort of cookie cutter kind of a rural urbanization projects where they just take over large rural areas and just sort of spread uh, out to, and, and they went public on the New York stock, on, on, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the, 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 when they went public the company was worth something like $25 billion and since the daughter is 25 years old she had half the share, she's now worth, you know, half of that. I mean, this is, I mean, this is astonishing wealth being accumulated out of this kind of dynamic of, of project. But the thing that's interesting to me about this project is precisely represented, again, by this transformation of scale, that the scale has moved. It's no longer about metropolitan regions. It's not even about the nation anymore. It's about a global urbanization process. And that global urbanization process needs what? New financial institutions. And what are the new kinds of financial institutions about? Well, uh, I don't, I, I, I've actually spent a lot of time reading about this. They're still very hard to figure out exactly what it is. But the main thing is securitization of, of mortgages, which means that you no longer know who holds your mortgage. I mean, when I went to Baltimore in 1969, you knew who held your mortgage. And if you got into a problem, you knew who to go to. Right now, all those mortgages get packaged into, into vast packages, and then people invest in the packages, and then they invest in the investment in the packages. And so this was all supposed to, to spread risk. And people then had the illusion that if you spread risk, you eliminate risk. But you don't. Actually, what you do is you accumulate risk. That is, you take risk to a much higher level. And what we're seeing right now is somebody's asked the question, what's inside all of those big packages? Exactly as they asked in 1973, exactly as they asked the Houseman thing, is there anything inside there? And when they prod, they find, oh my God, there's nothing much in there. Oh dear, now what are we going to do? You know? Well, you then get a tremendous kind of impact and a tremendous kind of devaluation which, 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 which goes on. Now, at this point, however, you then get another part of the story, which is, what is the uneven impact of this process. And again, there's a long continuity in this, which is very distressing, actually. And the long continuity looks like this. That actually, if you look at what has happened in this country, about two million people have lost their homes to foreclosure. Probably another million or two million are going to lose them. When you look at the population that's been affected, it's uh, either inner city African American, large impact on single headed household women. It's a classic case where gender, race, and class are actually in, you know, integral to each other. And there's a tremendous impact of that sort. In the American Southwest, you have a slightly different pattern. It's mainly a white population that finding it couldn't live close to the city except living with them, decided they'd go live way out in the urban periphery. 30, 40 miles out from the central cities. And there they were buying <laughs> some tract housing that was being built out there using subprime mortgages to get in there. They now have a double whammy. Their subprime mortgages are setting up high. The gas prices they've got to pay in order to commute back into the city have, have, have really escalated. So they're caught with a double whammy too. So you have this, this impact, okay. And you say, okay, people are losing their assets. That is, they're losing value. <laughs> And then you say, well, isn't it interesting? The Wall Street bonuses were declared at the end of January, and the Wall Street bonuses this year came out at $32 billion. So wouldn't you like to be rewarded with $32 billion for screwing up the whole global financial system? <laughs> this is, in effect, what's happened. 
And that was only 1% less than it was the year before when things were supposedly going very well. So they've not suffered at all. They're doing fine. And OK, some of them are forced to step down from their positions, but they don't pay back any of the 10, 15, or 20 million they were earning every year over the last 15 years. They don't pay any of that back. Furthermore, some of them have given golden handshakes. 100 million or 200 million dollars. Isn't that astonishing? Oh, and by the way, has anybody told you recently the concept of class is irrelevant? <laughs> if they do, just tell them they're full of shit, okay? <laughs> and, tell them, and, tell them, and tell them to go watch this one, okay? Watch this one unfold. Because this is about real class violence, which is being done to lower classes who are least able, least able, to really resist them. Now, isn't it interesting? Go back and read Engels. And what does Engels say? Engels says the bourgeoisie only has one way to solve its housing problem, re poverty problem, problems in general. It moves it around. It takes over a particular place and kind of says, hey, we've reformed this place, we've done something great with this place, i.e. we've gentrified it or something like that. Meanwhile, the poverty shifts somewhere else. And the impact shifts somewhere else. You're moving it around. And as you move it around, Engels also talks in the housing question, published in 19, 1872, he also talks about the fact that as creative destruction takes over and you start to reshape cities, what you have to do is you have to start to dispossess those who are least powerful. So he talks about the way in which working class populations on high value land are steadily displaced. Sound familiar? And actually right now, there is a politics of dispossession going on in urban neighborhoods. For instance, in Mumbai there is a, a famous so-called slum called Dharavi. Dharavi is, you know, famous as a kind of ecological kind of construct in which all kinds of nasty things take place, but, you know, that's where the tanning takes place, it ends up in your handbags on, in Saks Fifth Avenue, you know, that kind of stuff. So they, they want to get control of Dharavi because it's on high value land. The value of the land is around $2 billion estimated. But unfortunately, these slum dwellers are on it. So they want to get them out of there. So they start to come up with all these kinds of plans. And of course, they use the environmental argument. What an environmental disaster it is inside of Dharavi. They've got to get rid of the environmental kind of questions and, and what, all the rest of it. And under the Indian constitution, if you've been resident in an area for long enough, uh, you can claim rights of residency. The trouble is, if you're a slum dweller, it's very hard to prove that you've been a resident. How do you prove it? I mean, you don't have any landlord chips, you don't have any electricity bills and property taxes, you can't actually prove it. It's very hard to prove that you've been a residency there. And if, if somebody attests to the fact of the proof, you immediately find out. Of course, they are, you attest to them and they attest to you, you're all liars, aren't you, anyway? So this thing goes to the Indian Supreme Court as to whether people in these areas are entitled to compensation. And the Indian Supreme Court, which has gone neoliberal just pretty badly, uh, said no, they cannot be compensated. To compensate a slum dweller for their illegal occupation of the land is like compensating a pickpocket for their actions. That's actually in the official Supreme Court statement. Which is, OK, they can be displaced. They can just be wiped out of there. Well, there's been political resistance on Darabi. And political resistance in other parts of India, where in Nandi Gram, where there's a massacre of, of populations resisting these kinds of displacements. There's a politics of dispossession going on around this attempt to rejig the cities more after their heart's desire, not after our heart's desire or their heart's desire. In other words, there's a big question right now as to whose heart's desire is it that's driving the reconfiguration of the city.